stress is a major killer in the developed world, so let me reassure you now, you are going to see fish caught like this, and this, and this. However, when I meet Gary Flint, Captain Flint, in the car park of a marina in Liverpool, he is stressed. So, no worms going? No worms, yes. Still waiting. I don't want you to feel stressed on his behalf. Nor is this the best time of year to go out. Gary explains what we're after. Flounder, yeah, with possibility of flounder. We had four or five the other day when we were out. Plenty of dabs, a lot of whiting, pin whiting, a small whiting. The occasional rates are about seven pound, eight pound. Um, we get good soap in the summer from late May on to, well, last year it was to late August. We get them up to 60 pound, 70 pound. Wow. Regularly going out, getting maybe seven or eight on the boat, plus 15 or 16 runs. What was, uh, what was your smallest bait last year? The smallest last year was 38 pound that we landed. Winter's the icing on the cake for us because the cod fishing, I'd say, is one of the best places in the UK. Yeah. Here in the Mersey. It's supposed to be in this no, no, this is like very, very good. We've got, we have um, 10 boats, something like that, running from here in the winter. We have the boats from Wales coming in because the fishing's that good in the Mersey. At last, the bait arrives. Then it's time to set off out of the marina. There's a lock system here. It opens two hours before high tide and two hours after, so you have to time your trips perfectly. This duck with her two ducklings is risking everything by joining the queue. The other boats take no prisoners, but she and the babies make it. Boat fishing is often a long chug out to a point where you can't see land. Not in Liverpool. We drop anchor within sight of the Three Graces, the Royal Liver Building, the Cunard Building and the Port of Liverpool Building, just out of the main shipping lane. And Gary is able to talk about his bait. Yeah, right, bait we've got today. We, we're targeting dabs, flounders, thornback rays. We've got um, squid for the thornback rays. We've got um, peeler crab. We've got uh, razorfish, mackerel, and we've also got prawns to top them with. The baits we've already made up, the crab are already bound with elastic to make them easier to go on the hook. We've also got uh, fresh black lug, which is behind you, and we've got a uh, live ragworm for the place. We tend to find the place feed more on the rag, and we have the crab for flounder. Dabs will literally scratch at anything, so we tend to use worm and tip it with a bit of mackerel or tip it with a bit of squid and that's basically it it's a case of getting the lines in the water and away we go it's not long before the rod tips start twitching we are into the whiting in a big way British record. Uh, Mech, if you've got your, your uh, disgorger, you know you would. We also start catching dab, but not many of a keepable size. What's a keepable fish here? Uh, 20, 20 centimetres for a dab. Um, the biggest dab caught is, well, what is it, Mech? £2.9 in the UK? £2.9 is the biggest. And what's UK. the Irish one? £2.5. And who was the Irish one? I think his name's Mick Duck. <laughs> Very funny. The truth is, this is Mickey Duff, and he holds the Irish dab record. Uh, I was fishing with uh, lugworm and ragworm uh, on a flowing chase, and well, it, it just took it, took the bait, and went, and that was it. I, I didn't even know it was a dab. I didn't even know it was a record till we got it back on shore. You must have known it was a big fish. I knew it was a big fish, yeah. Yeah, I didn't think it was a record. And you got it on shore. What, what, well, how did the locals react? Uh, they were amazed. <laughs> They've never seen anything like it. So if you were out in the Mersey, where's the best place to fish? Gary explains the layout of the shipping channel. We're in the rock channel at the moment. The fish are obviously scattered all over here. They're just dabs and whiting at the moment. But we have the main channel round to the left where the ships are coming in, that's called the Queen's Channel. 
and that's got a wall either side of it which retains the sand back which they built it with many many barges which are, the empty barges are dumped out at sea now but that travels roughly from the lighthouse there right the way round to the wind farm which is over here and it's both sides does a cracking job retaining the sand back it's good for the fish now, the elderly rock star who takes up angling is a bit of a cliché, so perhaps it is unsurprising that this boat has its own rock star. He needs no introduction, except maybe this. <laughs> Uh, can we have a word, please? Come, uh, that's, that's good. Okay, all right. I understand. I understand. Then, obviously, you know, he's been on the boat a lot. Does he have any special dietary requirements? Uh, no, not really. He'll just eat anything, really. He doesn't care. He'll have a bit of both. Bit of he's, both. he's special. He's been quite healthy since the 70s, though, hasn't yeah, he? Yeah, yeah. He's probably brown. I've, I've met him, yeah. yeah. Is he a yeah. nice guy? He's a nice guy, yeah. He's spot on. Good, good angler? Good angler, yeah. yeah. He enjoys himself. Every time he comes out, he has a, really enjoys himself. Just let himself go, just like one of the boys. Now you may have noticed that this boat has more than a normal number of Daiwa stickers on board. That is because, like us, it is sponsored by the Scotland-based fishing tackle company. Daiwa's Nick Hill explains two of the staple rods for the sea fishing market. Well, this is a Procaster spoon rod from Daiwa, very versatile rod, which can be used today as we are in the, in the estuary in the sea fishing. It can also be used for pike fishing perhaps on a lake or canal. This one is a Kenzaki, one of Daiwa's most high profile boat rods. Um, it's generally shorter with thicker walls in the rod and stiffer, giving you more power when fishing. After pulling up dozens of fish, including this dogfish, it's time to move. We head upriver, just off the city centre. There's a special technique to this kind of fishing. Okay, at the moment we're up tiding, which is what we do a lot in the Mersey. As you can see now, Mickey's going to cast out, and if you watch where his weight goes, his weight will go up side of the boat and out to the side. Once it hits the bottom, it's now outside the scare zone, it will come back with the tide, and the weight will hit the bottom and grip the bottom, and he'll let slack line out so that the weight is pulled down tide, which will hold bottom. If a fish then, once he winds the slack line in that he's let there, he'll just take some slack in, put the bail arm on, put it in the rest, and the rod naturally will bend over with the run on it. If anything touches it, if you look at the end of my tip, if anything touches this rod now, the rod will spring up or will go down and nine times out of ten it will hook the fish itself. Now Gary is pessimistic about our chances of catching a thorny. But whatever Gary thinks, we do it. The old maid comes aboard, and that marks the end of a glorious day out on the Mersey. Right, lads, wind in. That's it. It's finished. Stay over. It's back to the lock exactly two hours after high tide. Gary is not, however, limited only to four-hour trips. If you want to go fishing with him, visit discoverycharters.co.uk. So Gary reckons this is the wrong time of year, the fishing's terrible, and we should have been here last week, or next week, or any week. The lads don't agree with him, and for one of the lads, this is the only time he can really be himself. It is no exaggeration to say that sea angling saved his life. Yeah, yeah, yeah.